Hello. I hope you can all. Uh, I hope you can all hear me today, and uh, let me know in the in the chat if you can. Uh, we'll wait a few minutes for a few other few people that might be late joining us to join us, uh, and we'll we'll take it from uh, we'll take it from there. So while we do that, while we're waiting for people, actually, I've just created a little poll, so I will publish the uh, publish the poll, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to hopefully you'll be able to see that. Uh, so we'll see uh, a little bit about if we can uh, our experience with using HLS uh, HLS before. So it's a great day to learn about HLS today. We've got sort of two hours or so uh, that we're gonna that, and we're gonna run through uh, five labs. We're gonna we're gonna start out right at the beginning. Uh, we're gonna do it step by step all all along the way, nice and nice and simply. Uh, we have a github link with everything that i hope that we need uh, and i'll put the github link here uh, and at that github link you can download the you can download all the you can download all the lab material all all of the slides and everything that we're that we're going to be doing over the over the next few hours uh, if you can't hear me, perhaps try having a uh, just double checking your double checking your audio uh, and making sure that you've got the right uh, the right elements there. So excellent. Okay, so the sounds good. People can people can generally hear me. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the session should be automatically recorded. And then it will be made available. It will be made available after uh, after we have seen um, after after the after the session. You should just be able to log back in uh, and and go with it and take it and take it from uh, and take it from there. Really. Uh, so uh, yeah, you'll be able to log in. Everything's there. You'll be able to you'll be able to see it all. So what we're going to do is we'll we'll make a start and and we'll do this. If you want to follow along. Uh, I've done this in Vitus 2021.2 because the latest version wasn't quite released. It should actually work in most versions of Vitus HLS. It, it should, uh, it shouldn't be a issue uh, if you've got anything that's not uh, not there. As we go through, pop it in the uh, in the questions or put it in the chat, and I'll try and keep an eye on, uh, and we'll walk through and we'll walk through uh, as we do it. So without further ado, you should be able to see this uh, this workshop, this work this workbook in the uh, in the GitHub library. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're going to run through a few elements of this. So we're going to take a look at the the standard Vitus HLS flow. And like I say, I've created a poll. So if you want to take a look at that and just let me know whether uh, what the experience with people using using HLS is, we're going to take a look at look at the basic HLS flow and create a basic Hello world, shall we say, uh, using Vitus HLS. Then we're going to take a look at the interfacing that we can do, the interfacing options that we've got to work with our, uh, we work with the IP block that we create, and that's really for me that's really exciting and one of the real key benefits of working with uh, HLS because it gives us that flexibility of uh, interfacing. So you know, with a, and as you'll see as we get to it, with a, uh, with a with a few pragmas, a few changes with pragmas, uh, we are able to uh, we are able to quite easily change our interface from having, say, a simple uh, standard logic interface, to having a more complex AXI interface, to having a FIFO interface or a VRAM interface, and that that's really quite quite important. Once we understand the basics of the flow and the interfacing, we're going to take a little bit more of a look at how we can do optimization. Uh, in in the design and what we can optimize for, we're then going to take a look at the um, the arbitrary precision maps. And this obviously one of the great important things of using Vitus HLS is in creating a new is in creating IP blocks that implement your algorithms. Uh, and we don't want to have to start from scratch. We don't want to have to start from scratch every time we do that. So we've got some uh, arbitrary precision maps that we're going to take a look at, and we're going to we're going to step through that. And then finally, I don't know if you're aware, but there's there's a whole host of Vitus uh, libraries that are provided by Xilinx, so a range of applications. Uh, we'll 
We'll talk a little bit more about it when we get to it, but there are several levels of these uh, of these libraries, and they're generally work for, meant for working with the heterogeneous system on chip elements. Uh, but actually, the lower level ones, the level one, the level one libraries, can actually be loaded into Vitus HLS on their own, uh, and we can create standalone IP P blocks on them that we can integrate with within our design. So we're going to take a look in that in that third, in that final session. We're going to take a look at the uh, Vitus libraries and how we can use those. How we can use those libraries. If you get any questions after it at all, you know, there's, there's my email address there. So please feel free to email out and, and get back and, we'll, and I'll try and uh, I'll try and help you through it. Please bear in mind that, that I do have a uh, I do have a day job. So sometimes it might take me a few minutes to uh, a few minutes or a few days to get back to you. But I will uh, genuinely try to get back and help you uh, if I if I possibly can. So this is one of the simpler labs we've done. You know, over the years, we've done really complex labs where you've needed hardware, where we've needed you know where we've needed if we, we did an arm m1 m3 lab where you needed the where you needed the rt board you needed bravado you needed sdk you needed arm keel you needed the right licenses for arm keel this is actually one of the most simple labs we've done we're not going to put anything on hardware today there's no hardware required at all and the only thing that we require is if you've got it is a version of vitus uh, and in this instance i've done all the examples in vitus 20 2021.2 20, but that shouldn't that shouldn't be an issue if you've not uh, if you've not got that installed. The, the example should work in most versions of Vitus uh, of Vitus HLS. Like I say, if as we went through it, any questions, just let me know. Just pop them in the chat, and I will try and uh, try and help you out and assist it there. So first off, we're going to start taking a look at the Vitus HLS flow. Uh, and I don't want to be this deaf by deaf by PowerPoint because last year we did a we did a webinar on. Uh, we did a webinar on HLS, but I just wanted to just to set the scene and just refresh everybody's mind a little bit as to what HLS actually is and how it and how it actually how it actually works in our FPGAs. So it's going to give us this ability to work with C, C++, OpenCL, and actually convert this into a um, actually convert it into RTL that we can implement within our within our Xilinx FPJ. And it doesn't have to be a heterogeneous SOC. When we're working with Vitus HLS, we can create IP codes that we can drop within just standard normal FPGA so that they, they don't have to have the SOC. Now, it's really interesting because to us as hardware engineers, you know, we spend our days doing uh, RTL work in VHDL and Verilog. We consider C a high level language. You know, software engineers, of course, consider it a very low level, uh, a very low level language. But HLS is really, it's really quite exciting, really quite interesting when we start looking at how we develop algorithms do, and when we want to do signal processing, data processing, or image manipulation. Uh, and it gives us a real raft of applications that we can use there uh, to, accel to, accelerate our, to accelerate our design. I can't remember if I've actually put it in the, put it in the slides or not. Uh, and probably figures that I uh, probably figures that I haven't, uh, but we have a nice and simple. Uh, we do a lot of work in my uh, in my company with HLS. Uh, and I don't think I put it in, so I'll, I'll I'll talk about it. But we do a lot of work with clients using using HLS, particularly combined with Pink, actually, uh, where we get some real rapid we, where we get some real rapid benefits. Uh, to do that, to do that, pro to do that process, and we've we've used HLS, you know, to do things such as control flow algorithms, such as uh, PIDs, and we'll 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 touch on that in a little bit. While we've used them to do high performance imaging, and by high performance imaging, I mean thousands of thousands of frames per second, uh, and we we've used them to do sort of lower level, smaller level sort of signal processing, signal control. And actually, we've used them for some things that you wouldn't uh, that you wouldn't expect it to be used for, such as flash controllers and such like, uh, when when timescales have been quite challenging on that particular project. Um, and, and writing it in writing it in C has been actually uh, beneficial to do that. So let's just like I was saying, you know, the benefits of HLS are we get out, we get time back. Essentially, it allows us to deliver our to deliver our solution uh, faster. We spend more time. We can spend more time working on the algorithm than having to worry about the RTL implementation. 
And as we're going to see today, we are able to do synthesis simulation, and we're also able to do co-simulation as well and target the uh, and target the hardware. So it works. It works really nicely to allow and allows us to get through uh, get through the solution uh, and and create and create that. There. It's one of the best things I've ever. Uh, one of the most exciting things I think I've come across actually really is working with um, working with HLS. And that's that's it. Obviously, there's a few constraints as you're going to go through it, and, and we're going to take a look at it. You know, we're going to we're going to learn that the, that we can't necessarily use all constructs, and the software written to run on CPUs and GPUs or MCUs is fundamentally different. To be honest, if we're going to run it on a if we want to run it on an F, if we want to run it on an FPGA, uh, so we have to think about that. You know, not all C constructs can be synthesized. You know, for example, we're not going to be able to synthesize a printf. Uh, you know, in, when we develop our embedded micro solutions, you know, printfs are, gr are great, but we're not going to be able to develop that. But we can debug it, as you'll see, uh, in different in different ways. We need to learn just we do with Verilog and VHDL, where the language is quite quite verbose, and there's a lot of there's a lot of features that we can use there. We only use with Verilog with VHDL. We only use a small subset of that. Of, 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 the, of the language. And it's also the same when we work with C, C++. There's a small subset that we work with that give us, that give us synthesizable coding styles. Uh, and that's one, of the, that's one of the key things that we need to, need to adapt to and, and work with. When it comes to working with uh, microarchitectures as well, we need to make sure that we get the correct microarchitecture for, for our solution, such that we are able to understand what is, what element is producing the data and what's consuming it. And that's going to be really important when we come to looking at optimization. And we want to be able to make sure that the data is flowing linearly, linearly and nicely and as optimized as possible. And that we're not stalling one element by the, uh, by the consumer. Ideally, as well, we want to be able to decompose the algorithm into small sections. Uh, which can be interconnected together because the smaller sections we've got, the easier it is to work with, the more e the, the more optimizations we can do, and we can also then focus on trying to achieve that overall throughput uh, to give it to give us the required uh, to give us the required performance. Uh, and going through all of this, you know, we're, we're hopefully going to learn about how we can interpret the design reports uh, and everything else that comes out of the tool because the tool the tool wants us. Uh, to be the tool wants us to be success. The tool wants us to be successful. You know, it wants us to get the get the the best performance design that we that we that we possibly can uh, out of out of the out of the structure and the code that the, the code that we've written. Which is a really great point, actually. So somebody's just asked a great point in the great point in the chat about would you call this a bottom up flow? And it really depends from the view of where you look at it. If you want to use Vitus HLS in conjunction with Vitus, the larger tool, and we're just creating one IP block, then it is it is a little bit of a bottom a bottom up flow. If you're architecting a standard FPJ, a normal FPJ, and you just want to create an IP block, then it's a top down flow just like you would be for any of your just like you would be for any of your FPJ designs. You know, you create the architecture, you work out what functional blocks you want, you say, well this one is a state machine, this one is a block RAM, this one this one we can use this IP core from. This one actually is the core of the algorithm. It's quite mathematical. And for proof of concept for acceleration times, initially, we'll start out using HLS. So it gives you the ability to create that HLS block and, and drop it in. And as you can, as, as I was saying earlier on, that makes it a little bit faster for us as engineers uh, to be able to develop it. Now, it might be that you develop that algorithm, you optimize it the best you can, and it still doesn't quite, still doesn't quite give you the performance that you want. But that's okay because you can still take that IP block, you can still integrate it in your design, and you can demonstrate to people that you know you're making progress. You've got you've got something there. You're you're steadily increasing in that technology readiness level, and then at least you understand what you've got to do when it goes away and starts and you start looking at perhaps doing uh, hand coding for the for the for the next element the next element of it. So our flow as we run through this is going to be really quite simple and, and quite straightforward. Uh, and we're going to focus today, we're going to focus on the Vivado, uh, the Vivado flow, so the, the top-down flow for creating the creating the IP course. And our, our flow is going to be dead simple. So first off, we're going to create a C model and a test bench. 
once we've created that C model and test bench, uh, and wherever we possibly can, we're going to leverage leverage any of the Vitus libraries that we can uh, that we can take. But once we've got that, we're going to use that to verify the algorithm that we've got within our within our software. Uh, and because obviously we're running in the software world, we can debug, we can breakpoint, we can watch register values, we can we can get that algorithm nicely optimized, nicely operating as we want. And we're working in the untimed C world, so we don't unfortunately get the chance to go and get a cup of tea every time we um, every, every time we're running a simulation or start a simulation running because it's a much faster iteration time. So it makes us much more uh, makes us much more efficient. Once we've got that, what we're going to do is we're going to convert that model into the rt into we're going to do a c to rtl uh, a c to rtl conversion uh, and we do and we do that the tool does that automatically and there's some interesting points that the tool is going to pick up on along the way as it goes with that once we've got that and we've got that up that initial and i always say to, to clients and to people when i'm doing this you know the first thing you want to do the first thing you want to do when you're working with hls or anything like that is you want to see that what you've written synthesizes you want to see that you can you can turn it into the RTL. Once you've done that, you can take a look at it and actually start thinking about the analysis and the optimization of it. So once you know that it synthesizes and it, and it converts and you've not and you've not broken any of the any of the, the rules for synthesis, then you can sort of take a look at it and say, well, actually, these interfaces I want to be in AXI registers, these I want to be AXI stream, these I want to be DRAM, these I want to be FIFO. And this is what I want to do in terms of my synthesis and uh, synthesis and uh, optimization. To give me the throughput I require, because the tool is going to, as you'll see when we come to the analysis section and the optimization section, the tool is going to make some fairly standard, fairly clever optimizations. But it's not going to do everything because if it did that, it might, it might. And what we're doing when we do this is we're trading performance for the logic resources. You know, if, if you're using a particularly small FPGA, it might create a solution that's much bigger. Than your than your FPGAs, so it bounds it, and then it it has some initial optimizations, and then it allows us as engineers to to add further optimizations and and take that. Obviously, once we've done our optimizations, once we're happy with our interfaces, what we want to do then is we just want to make sure that the block still functions correctly. Uh, so we're going to run, we can run through then, and we can run through then, and do the co-simulation that's going to take our test bench that we originally wrote our c test bench and it's going to apply it to the rtl the rtl that's been synthesized and it's going to tell us it should give us the exact same results so if we're if we're doing image processing and we're and we're and we're put we're applying an image through it and then we're saving the image we'll get exactly the same it'll flow through and it'll come out and we get an image that we can open as a, as a bmp or a jpeg or, or, or however we've done it and we can compare the results between the RTL version and the C version, or if we're doing signal processing, we can flow it through and we can do that same comparison of the of the two. Once we've got that out, once we've got that all done, once we've got the algorithm ready, the next step is we're then going to create and package it and take it into either create it as a as a Xilinx object that we can take into into Vitus uh, with, with with the XO. Uh, or we can take it into Bravado as an as a IP as an IP exact. So the the packaging uh, and somebody was just asking for a little clarification on this and thing. So the pack as you'll see when we get to it, the packaging is the same. It's the same flow. It's the same set. It's just a different it's just a different line we change. Just a drip, different drop down option that we check, select in the menu to say actually we want to create this as a Xilinx object that goes into the into the Vitus uh, the Vitus kernel flow, or we want to create it as, as IP exact. Uh, RTL structures that go into the, uh, the, the go into the go into the Vivado flow. So if you've not done this before, if you've not come across this before, we're going to go through three three simple stages to convert the uh, to convert our untimed C to um, our untimed C to timed RTL. And this is this is a really important thing that we understand for when we start looking at the optimization. And, and the synth and the synthesis because if if we don't understand how this is working then we can't really get the best of it so we go through three stages essentially we go through an initial stage called scheduling and in scheduling what we do is when we create a hls project you will see that the it asks you for the device and not only does it ask you for the device it asks you for the clock frequency and it also asks you for the uh, for the clock uncertainty 
Now, knowing the device that you're using, it has some basic timing information and it has uh, on the behavior of the, of the cells within, within the, that, target, that particular target device. We've just told it what clock frequency we, we want to use that and the uncertainty element, which we'll, which we'll take a look at it in a minute. So what we can do then, or what the tool can do then, is it can say, well, you've written this, this, this C algorithm, like in, in this instance, um, and you want to run at this clock frequency, and I, know the, and I know the performance of this device. So I know that on, on the first clock cycle, I can do the X multiplied by the X, the A multiplied by the X plus the, plus the B. But I don't have time then to take that and do the and do the final do the final one in one clock cycle. So I'll insert a register. I'll save that data in register, and then on the next clock cycle, we'll do the uh, the, the addition to C. So it, it does that initial scheduling um, scheduling, and the target device where the device where target and the clock frequency we tell it you want to clock this module at will have a big impact on the. Uh, on, on the scheduling of the number of operations it can fit between between clock cycles. So the tool's quite intelligent in that. Once it's done that, we go through this binding phase where it actually attempts to then bind the to bind the tool, sorry, bind the operations that it's just scheduled onto the clock or, or, onto the, the logic resources that are available in the device. So it might say uh, in this instance, you're doing a, an addition and a multiplication. I'm going to put that into a DSP48, or it might say it's going to put it into a add submodule. Once it's done the binding, depending upon the complexity of the module, it's then going to do and create what's called control logic extraction, which is going to give us a simple state machines that will read and write that will read and write modules uh, that will uh, read and write memories, block RAMs in there that will start and stop the, that will start and stop the uh, start and stop the uh, IP code and allow us to interact and work with it. So that's the simple uh, sort of steps that we're going to that we're going to go through. And this is what we need to think. I'm not going to give you lots of powerpoints, but this is what we need to think about when we get to that element of the uh, of the lab. So normally by default we have uh, only one clock cycle is is possible, as, as somebody was just asking there. Yeah. So we can only have one clock in in our uh, in our IP blocks, and it it makes it a little bit it makes it a little bit nicer. It means we're not accidentally uh, going to going to introduce a um, makes it a bit nice, simple. Makes it sure we're not going to accidentally introduce some clock domain crossing or something like that that might cause us some that might cause us some issues. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll we can just keep it with nice and one and one clock. Uh, so the clock definition, I mentioned this. This is really uh, this is really quite in, quite important there, and we need to define that clock frequency, you know, to make sure that we get the best out of it. We need to tell it what we expect our, our single clock to be running at. In this case, you know, we uh, this example it's it's popping onto a Prius Sama and we're running uh, at a at a five at a five nanosecond clock period. I've left the uncertainty blank, uh, and by default, it comes up. At 27, by default, the tool will use 27 percent as that, um, as as the um, as the uncertainty. If we don't, um, if we don't define anything, and that uncertainty, as it shows in the diagram there, that's pure. That's the margin that that, that it puts in there. Because remember, this is going from C to VHDL or Verilog. It's not going from C to gates. So when the synthesis tool runs, when the synthesis engine runs. And it go, as we go through the implementation, it's again it's going to make optimizations, it's going to make considerations, and then there's placement and then there's place and routing to occur. So we need to leave some margin. We need to leave some margin uh, for that to uh, for that to, to that to run through and be nice and effective. So what we're going to do now, if if you're following along, is I'm going to stop sharing this screen or stop sharing the slides for for, for the thing, for the time being. Anyway. And I'm going to create the first the first project. So I've opened uh, my Vitus 2021.1 in the best Blue Peter tradition. It was uh, it was already open. And the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to go here and we're going to click on uh, create create project and we're going to create a project. Uh, it's going to ask us what what project name we want to what we want to call it. I'm going to call this lab. Lab one, and I'm about to prove that I can't type while I am uh, while I'm talking. 
Uh, and then I'm going to work out where I want to store my uh, where I want to store my projects uh, with a little bit of pre thought as well. Earlier on, I've created a folder just on the root of my C drive just to just to store this uh, just to store this within there. Once you've selected a project name and a project location, uh, click on Next, and then. Uh, we can add in any files if we want to. So if we've already got some files that we've exist that, that are existing or that we've downloaded uh, from from a GitHub or from the repository, we could we could add these in. Uh, I'm not going to add these in at the moment because I want to show you how to create them from scratch and and work with it that way. So we're going to leave this one blank and we're going to click on next. Similarly with test bench, we have no test benches, so we're going to click on next. And then in the solution here we're going to change a few things and set a few things up. In this case, we're going to click on this little tab uh, down in the corner here. We're going to leave this Vivado IP flow target uh, by default. We're going to click on this little tab here, and then we're going to click on the boards. Now, I'm actually going to target, the for, for, for a few reasons, the 70 the 701 board, which should be in here. Nice speed. Oh, I'm jumping back at it. What's that going off there for us? So let's go down here. It'll be in here somewhere. Spartan. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to target a, a Spartan uh, 7, uh, an SP701 board uh, for, the, for this application, just to just to show that we're picking a picking a fairly normal FPGA and we can we can do it. Feel free to select any others, but just be careful to make sure that it is all actually installed on your uh, on your machine uh, and that it's not going to be an issue. So I'm going to select this SP701 uh, and then I'm going to click finish. Uh, and my computer is always slow when it is doing a uh, live when it's doing a live demonstration. I don't know why the screen sharing seems to make it uh, make it make it go much much slower than normal. So this is the once we've created the project. This is the work ex, this is the workspace that we that we see. Uh, we see the we see the project explorer down here. We see the flow navigator. We have the workspace area here that we're gonna we will be working in in a little while. And then we have the console, the errors, the warnings, the guidance properties, Git repository integration, and most importantly modules and loops. Excuse me, which we'll look at, which we will look at in a little while, uh, and we will uh, we will take it from we'll take it from there. First things first is I'm going to actually create some files now. So we're, we're ready now. We've got our project, and what we want to do is start adding in uh, the next the next element of uh, next element of files. So we're going to first here we're going to go to our sources here, uh, and we're going to right click on it, and we're going to add new source. Uh, once we've done that, we're going to select where to save it. So I'm just going to save it under the lab under the lab one project there, uh, and I'm going to call this lab one dot cpp. So we're going to save this as a C plus plus file, uh, and we're going to save it as the lab as the lab one. And then we're going to save we're going to save that file. I'm going to create something very simple. We're going to create something very simple here, uh, and hopefully this is going to jump up. Uh, and I'm not actually going to type this in. Uh, you, you can do it if you want, but if you've downloaded, if you've downloaded the GitHub, if you've downloaded the, um, if you've downloaded the GitHub, you should be, you should see these files as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy and paste these in for the time being, uh, because it'll save us a little time. Uh, so I'm going to copy that in, and I'm going to save that. Uh, and this is just doing a simple, a simple addition. And multiplication a times a times b plus plus c a really really nice simple hello world project that we can uh, that we can get started with uh, and take and take a and take a look at so please feel free as we go through this any questions any clarifications just pop it in the uh, in the chat uh, and we'll we'll try and get back get an answer to you once we've done this so Every file that we create, you know, we want to be able to create it and use it from and create a test bench that uses it. And to make sure to do that, we obviously need to make this 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 element visible. So I'm going to create a a header file as well. Under here, so I'm going to create a new uh, a new source file, uh, and I'm going to call this lab 
1.h uh, and save that as well. Uh, and then from my code, I'm going to get the lab1.h. And you see it's already opened here, and I'm just going to copy and paste in uh, the function, the function definite, the function definite, the function definition. In fact, actually, in here, it should probably have include lab. There we go. Include lab one dot h. Just to be on the, uh, just to be on the, just to be on the safe side. Now we've got that. So this is our basic application. We've got a simple, uh, simple, simple IP core file created. We've got a simple C file. We've got a, we've got a header file created. What we want to do now is we need to test it. We need to test this algorithm. I know it's, it, in this instance, it's it's probably limited that I have that I have broken anything uh, or that I've written the algorithm right. But I'm not perfect, so we should uh, we should try and validate that and, and run through it and, and make a good good check on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the test bench and we're going to we're going to create a new test bench file. Um, and then this time uh, we're going to um, we're going to call it TB Lab 16 dot CPP Lab 6 even Lab 1 even dot CPP um, can't type today and we're going to put that in our we're going to put that in our project so the U int uh, 16T that's a standard uh, that's a standard type of that's a standard C type uh, that's defined within this within within standard uh, within standard int. Uh, and, and one of the key things that we need to do when we're working with HLS, particularly as you'll see this as we move fur further forwards, is we need to use types uh, that we can see uh, for the uh, for the element. Um, so we can we can see that, and if we if we want to see the U, the UIN 16T, you can I think you can actually click on it, and I'm not going to do it because it'll open up a lot of files, uh, but we can we can uh, then see the open declaration, and you can see it's defined within that they're defined within standard um, standard int.h. Once we've got that, I will try and work out a way to zoom in in a second in a second on the text. I appreciate that it's a little. Uh, a little small. I don't know. Just give me a second. I don't know if there's anything uh, I can do to zoom in on uh, on the app. So I'll, I'll take a look at that and try and work, work it out. If not, anyway, you can see all of the text. If you can, if you can download the GitHub, if you can get the GitHub links that I put in the chat at the beginning, uh, you can see all of the uh, all of the other all of the other elements that are, that are there. Uh, for the test bench, we're going to do something fairly similar as well. Uh, we're just going to put in a simple bit of uh, a simple bit of code. Oh, it's a simple bit of code. He says we're going to put in a simple bit of code, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more complicated. We're going to uh, we're going to create some uh, A's and we're going to create some A's and B's. Uh, and then what we're going to do is how this works is uh, we're going to create some some arrays with random numbers for A's, B's, and C's in there. Uh, and then we're going to iterate through this array, and we're going to create the we're going to calculate the result for each iteration of the um, of the array. Uh, once we've got that, we're then going to for each iteration round the loop as well as calculating it in the C in the C test bench. We're going to call our function and calculate it in our uh, we're going to call our function, calculate it in our function as well, and then do a comparison of the. Uh, of the results, so it's a nice and simple, uh, fairly straightforward uh, operation. Now we've entered all our code. We've got everything. We've got everything in there. We should, in theory, be ready to be ready to go and, and try and do some simulation. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the simulation element of it, and we're going to try and see how this works. Now we can do this in two ways. We can we can run the C simulation from the Flow Navigator here, or we can drop down. And run the C simulation from the uh, from the, from the menu there. So let's just click on C simulation. You'll see it gives us a dialog box. Um, and what we want to um, what we want to do 
Uh, and somebody saying they're jealous of the dark mode, Vitus, Vivado, they need to figure that out. Uh, I actually can't remember how I set it, and I was trying to unset it, uh, and I can't remember. And I can't remember how I how I did it. If I if I work it out, I'll I'll pop it on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or something. Um, it's like anything. I kind of played with it, and it it, it just sort of uh, just sort of happened. Um, yeah, maybe the next maybe we'll do it in the next Zed Chronicles. I'll 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 sit I'll I'll, I'll sit there and try and work out how I uh, how I got it into the the dark mode. Now, when we come to do the C simulation, we get two options. We can just compile it and run it, and we'll see the output in the console. Or, like with many things, we might want to debug it and see how it's going on. Now, this is a fairly simple application, I, I, I grant you. Uh, but for for the more complicated applications that we do, we might want to de we might want to debug it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell this to uh, launch the debugger uh, as it's done it. I don't have any input arguments. I'm not passing any command line articles or anything like that to it. Uh, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to click OK. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that a simul that it actually works in re that it actually works in reality. Uh, we've we've run through it a couple of times today, uh, but but lives always uh, slightly uh, slightly different, of course. Uh, so you'll see it run through, uh, and because obviously one thing I didn't say is we're in an eclipse based environment. We're in an eclipse based environment here, um, and we can see the. Um, we can see this running. We can see this running through now. So, because we're in this environment, we've actually our application has stopped, uh, which is really, which is really quite cool. It stopped here uh, to wait in execution. Uh, so, if we want to, we can uh, hover over elements of it, and we can see that there's there's not much actually being being put in there yet to help us debug. And we've got controls up here to resume to to just run the application if we want. Or to pause the application, although you probably won't get you probably wouldn't get a chance if you did that in this small application. Or to single step over the over the instructions. So if we single step over a few of these, uh, what we'll see is we'll see that we get the values uh, we get the values coming up and being filled in if we hover over them uh, as to what we're as to what we're looking for. So we get some nice. Uh, I don't know, out of my experience, see yet. So we get some, we get the values coming in, and you can, and, you, and it shows you what's uh, what's changed, and then the representation down the bottom. So this is a nice way to help us debug and see what's going on uh, when we take a look in our um, in our design. If we want to, uh, we can insert a um, we can insert a breakpoint. So if we wanted to, uh, we will we will do this. Uh, and somebody's just asking about um, conversion for fixed points to floating points. We're going to cover that later on uh, in the uh, in, in one of the labs. So please just be uh, be patient, and we will we will get to that. We will get that. We will get to that bit. Slightly different to the um, slightly different to the um, to the instructions. I'm going to double click on this this element here, and I'm going to click on run. And it, you see it runs through. We can add breakpoints in. Now, if we want to as well, what's really really cool about this is we can then step into the uh, we can then step into the algorithm if we want, or in our C algorithm if we want, we can double click and put a we can double click and put a breakpoint on there. And if we hit run, it'll jump at the breakpoint, and we can do all of the uh, analysis and debugging and, and looking. We can see over here we can see the watch points that we can see the we can see the values the types and everything so it really helps us debug our algorithm in c just as we would if we were targeting the targeting the arm core on a zinc for example uh, to to work out what's to work out what's going on i'm going to remove these breakpoints now um, and then hopefully if i hit run what we should see down in here is we should see lots of lots of passes as each loop it goes round and it passes and it and it agrees that so it agrees that what we've calculated in the in the test bench is the exact same data as what we've calculated in the other in the earlier test bench sorry in the module once we've done that we can hit the exit debug mode uh, to exit debug and then what we're going to go to is we're going to go and take a look at our project solutions uh, which are available under here uh, so we're going to go to project settings, uh, and what we're going to go to is we're going to go to synthesis then. And to be able to synthesize the design, we need to tell it what the top level of the 
uh, what the top level of the design is. So we're going to come here. We've got the top function. We're going to click on browse. It's going to analyze our, our RTL. So it's going to analyze what's in the source element here. And it's going to give us a list of functions. And we can select the one we want to be the top. In this case, it's dead simple. There's only one. Uh, so we're going to generate the, we're going to say that we're going to go with lab one. Uh, and then I don't think we're going to make any other changes to that. We're going to click on that as OK. And now for the first time, we're now ready that we can, we're, we're, we've written our algorithm, we've tested our algorithm, simple algorithm that it is, uh, and we're now ready to try and run the C synthesis. So we're going to run C synthesis. Uh, it's going to ask us our default plot period. Uh, we're going to leave that at 10, but it's going to ask us our flow target. And we're going to click on OK. And hopefully this should run through uh, much faster than you will see if we were trying to implement it in uh, in real world RTL or anything. Uh, and we should get a nice and simple solution pop up after a few seconds. And there's some interesting things for us to look at in this in this solution. Then you know we can see the uh, we can see the latency of the we can see the latency of the module. Uh, so it takes three clock cycles to calculate. To calculate this, uh, to calculate this, uh, this, this algorithm, we can see that it takes four clock cycles before you can begin to put a new calculation to it, which makes sense because it takes three calculations to uh, three clock cycles to do the calculation. So on the fourth one, you can you can put a new you can put some new data into it. It tells us what our it tells us what our utilization is. So we've got one DSP, four flip flops, and twenty seven lookup tables. And it also then kept, tells us what interfacing we've got. So we have uh, interfacing, you know, we've got a simple register interface with uh, A, B, and C. We've got the output coming out as well as a 16-bit output, and then we've also got the clocks and the uh, the clock for reset and the AP control interface to start and stop this module and, and understand the status of it. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the interfacing module in, in a little while. Also, we've got the software information. If we were to be working with, if, if we were to be working with software, we know exactly what we need to feed into it: the data type, the directions, and such like, and the software to hardware, the software to hardware mapping. So it gives us a really, uh, a really nice um, level of information on our design. If we want to see uh, the what it schedules like, we can take a look at this. So we can take a look at the schedule viewer, uh, and we will see. And we can click on we can click on the schedule view. So we can see it's doing the A and the B read. We can see the we can see the multiplier is taking the uh, the first and the second clock cycle, and then we can see uh, the the result from that uh, is taking is taking the uh, the second clock cycle that makes us be able to start on the fourth time. We can right click on this, and if we want to, we can we can jump to the source, and it will show us where the it'll show us where the source is as well. Once we've got this and we're happy with our synthesis, in this instance, we're not going to make any optimizations or anything like that. Uh, we can then go through and we can run through a co-simulation. Uh, and in our co-simulation, uh, we can get traces if we want. In this instance, I'm just going to ask it for the, uh, for the port traces. Uh, and I'm going to click on OK. And it will run a... It will run a gate level. So it will run a uh, co simulation for us that will come back and tell us, oh, it should tell us the same results as we've been seeing before. So while that runs for a couple of seconds, is there any questions or anything that we want to, that anybody wants to pop into the, um, into the, into the chat window? Just, just drop them in there uh, and, we'll, and we'll try and answer them. Uh, I'm going to put another question in there uh, in the poll uh, about the next actual the next webinar that I'm thinking of doing uh, while that runs through it's nearly run let's run through now uh, so we'll send that poll out there uh, and you can see as we've run this through we can see the comeback it tells us pass because it's run through and it's checked that all of the all the, the parameters and everything is the um, is the same uh, that it was when it ran through the C simulation, uh, and we can and we can see uh, and we can and we can see that there. So what we've done now is a really quick whistle stop tour through the 
uh, through the HLS elements of it and, and through the flow that we've got. So we've gone through how to create a project, how to how to create the test benches and the sources, how to do a C simulation, how to do the project synthesis, how to set the project up for synthesis, do the synthesis, and how to do the co how to do the co simulation. Now this is important because as we go through these other labs now we're going to assume some of this basic we're going to assume some of this basic knowledge uh, somebody was just asking a question about the resource utilization uh, being fairly consistent with what we see in Vivado uh, and to be honest I think it's pretty accurate I don't I, I would say the number is within sort of five uh, percent of what 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 you see when you actually implement it in in Vivado at the end of at the end of the day, uh, obviously it depends upon the settings that you've got in Vivado as well, and and, and how aggressive you're being uh, in Vivado with your synthesis settings. But but I would say it's it's fairly uh, it's fairly spot on. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at how we can do some interfacing in with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this project, um, and I will and Andre will 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 talk about that in a little while about how to put build this into a larger larger Vivado project um, in a few uh, in a few slides. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the the C to the C to RTL diff, the C to RTL co simulation uh, it does use the same test bench. So it takes that C test bench that we created and it applies it to the and it applies it to the RTL running through the Vivado simulator. Uh, and then grabs it back and pulls it through. It's really quite nice how it does that. And it's really quite intelligent, obviously, how it how it does that. Um, so what are you saying? What's the difference between Vivado HLS and Vitus HLS? Um, I don't know if there's anybody from Xilinx in the chat that might want to might want to take a step at that. I think Vitus HLS has got a few more has got a few more options by default, and it's part of the project and it's part of the project roadmap. I think and it ties in uh, nicer. Uh, with uh, with the bite with the overall vitus uh, with the overall vitus flow. So now what we're going to do is we're going to create a project uh, for the for our second uh, second lab. I'm going to go back here, go to my C drive. I tell you, it's going to be close on two hours on this one. I, th I thought we might be finished after twenty minutes, but uh, I am talking far too much. So we're going to go to C. Where are we? HLS live. Uh, I'm going to select that folder and we're going to call this one lab two. I have uh, imaginative uh, imaginative names for this. We're going to leave the uh, we're going to leave the file we're going to leave the files for this again empty. Uh, we're going to select the board. I'm going to select the same board as before just because I have an affinity for that uh, for that board and it's a fairly uh, fairly common target that people might have. Uh, I've, I've, to be honest, I, I think Julian might actually know quite a lot about this as he's popping in the chat. Uh, but I've never really seen a huge difference between Vitus uh, HLS and Vivado HLS on code. Uh, I've been able to take code from uh, either and, and and run it through. I have some clients that they're on slightly older versions and they want uh, Vivado HLS output for, for the tool chain. Uh, and, and I have other ones that are on uh, a newer version, um, and we go through, uh, and we go through the same the same way. We're going to create the files again, so we're going to create the new source files. Uh, and this time we've got a. Uh, we're getting a little bit more involved with our code. We've got it. We've, we've now put it. We're now taking the loop and taking the loop out of the RTL, uh, out of the test bench, and putting it in the, uh, putting it in the source. We're going to create a lab 2.h uh, into which we're going to put the definition, uh, and we're going to define the size in that. And then we're going to create a test bench source as well. And we're going to call that TB lab 2.cdp. Uh, into which we're going to put the same, we're going to put the code uh, from here. So this gives us a nice, uh, nice element of, uh, of code. Uh, and it, it is it's so it is so straightforward it's really nice and simple and, and easy to use this this uh, this HLS I'm a real 
two big things out of Xylance that I really love, you know, I, well, I love everything really to be fair, but the, the, the Vitus HLS and Pink, I think are my two biggest, uh, two biggest loves at the, at the moment. So we've got our code in there. And again, I'm, I'm not single stepping you through that because I've already shown you, uh, shown you how to do that, but we've got, uh, we've got the code in there. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we can run the C simulation this time. So we'll run it this way. We can launch the debugger, uh, and we'll see that it is uh, step by step uh, based. So while that runs, can can Vitus HLS be used for soft core processes that are not Xilinx based? For example, develop projects with this five based processes. Uh, I don't think really. I mean, you can you can create IP that will connect to any risk five processor as long as it's in a Xilinx architecture. So if you, for example, were using the blue spec risk five. Uh, Risk five uh, core. It's got an AXI interface on it. You could create an IP core for your Xilinx FPJ using Vitus HLS that would connect to that AXI. Would connect to that AXI uh, that that, I, that AXI bridge. Uh, it's not going to operate like the like the like the high level Vitus does, uh, where where you change this, uh, where you can use OpenCL to move functions from the processor into the programmable logic pretty much seamlessly because in that instance hls is all called under the hood uh, but you could you could create that and, and tie that tie that together uh, once we've got this once we've got this running we can see we can see this time uh, we're running a little bit more batch based in the um, in this simu in this simulation we're sending a batch of we're sending a batch of data across uh, and then we're and then we're running through the uh, HLS results. We've got the uh, lab two called in there. So we're calling lab two here. We're telling it the size this time. This time we've got a parameter called size because if you look back at the code here, um, we've got the A, the B, the C, and the result. Uh, and I should be taken out and shot for not make, for, for not sizing these uh, parameters in the arrays as well. Uh, but we've also got a loop that controls the number of iterations it's going to go. Uh, it's going to go. It's going to go around. Uh, so we're providing it with the the, num the size of this, which is 32 iterations in this case, and the and the results. And again, we're doing the calculation. Uh, we're doing the calculation on the fly. So if we just hit run, uh, we'll see that it all runs through and it all and it all passes, which is which is good. But that's not what I really wanted to show you in this. I wanted to show you that it works, of course, and how it works. But what we want to take a look at in this instance is the interfacing and how we can change the interfacing. So within within the within this tab here, uh, we can open the directives tab if I can find it. And on that one window, where's it gone? Directives. So we can open the we can open the directives tab, and this is one of the great things about Vitus HLS is we can we can then do the optimization. So in the next lab we're going to look at optimizing for performance and what we can do for optimizing for performance. In this lab we're going to take a look at how we can control those interfaces and what we can what we can do with those interfaces. So if you remember last time when we did the synthesis, everything just popped out as vectors. So we would have an IP block and we would have a number of ports connected to it. We would have a, B, C, they were the vectors, they'd be 16-bit ports going in. We'd have the result coming out, again, another 16-bit port, and we'd have some standard logic interfaces that did the, the, the stop, the start, the status of the, of the module. Now, for simple IP blocks, that's, that's perfectly fine, but we might, want to we might want to change that. So what we can do uh, is we can change the interfacing, we can change the interfacing direct. In fact, let me just run the simulate the synthesis now uh, on this one by default and we'll oh, forgot to set the top the top element and that's another great thing I did that I obviously did that on purpose uh, you know Vivar, uh, Vitus HLS will tell you if you've not set that if you if you've not set something uh, not set something like so we're going to set that and then we will run the C we will run the C synthesis uh, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the uh, in the chat window, and I will uh, I will try and uh, answer them. 
Um, and I put, like I say, I put the I put the workshop poll in there for, for perhaps the next one for in a in a month or so's time. And if anybody's got any other suggestions they'd like us to see us run a webinar on, you know, please throw it in the uh, please throw it in the uh, in the chat window. So this is run, and, and what we can see this time is we have uh, this time we've created memories that are that are because we're working with arrays. Uh, we have memory style. In, we have memory style interfaces. So we've got address. Uh, we've got addressing and data uh, for the A, for the B, for the C, and for the result. We've got a register interface. It's just a normal interface for the number of loops. A 16-bit interface for the number of loops. And then we've got again. We've got this control interface down here. So if we were to visualize the block, it would be uh, be a nicely visual block. What I want to do though is I'm going to change my I'm going to change this design ever so slightly such that we've got different interfaces on it, uh, and I'm going to do that using the uh, using the directive uh, using the directive view. Uh, so there's a few things that we can do on this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select this loop here, um, and I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to insert a directive. Now, when I insert a directive, I get the option: Do I want to include this within a within the source code uh, or within the directive file? Now, it, it depends upon how you want to do configuration control and source control and such like. Um, I'm going to put out I'll, I'll, for, for the purposes of this lab. I'll tell it to pop it in the uh, in the source code so that we can we can see it. And I'm going to change the directive type because I don't want to do an aggregate, but I want to do an interface type on this. So once we get down here, you can see it's picked up the port. It's picked up, it said I want port loop, and I can pick up the type of interface that I want it to be. And I'm going to interface this with a microblaze processor, shall we say, for example. Uh, so I want to be able to write this over an AXI, um, over an AXI, over an AXI interface. Uh, if I want to, I can then set some elements here, some additional optional elements and such like here. Uh, but I don't want to. I'm just going to. I'm just going to leave that as it is, and I'm going to click OK. And you'll see now we've got this that we've got this pragma defined for the HLS interface, and we have the pragma here that's now appeared in our in our code. But if I'm going to have an AXI interface to control this, I might as well control the entire block. You know, stop, start, see whether it's ready to go uh, from uh, from the AXI interface as well. So we'll do that. We can do that as well by selecting on the uh, Selected on the lab two at the top and say insert directive, and then we can select interface and we can select the type here and say slave AXI light interface um, and click OK. Uh, and we see then that we have a um, an AXI port with the port called with the port called return. Uh, and if we were there then we run the synthesis actually first off we save it uh, and then we'll run the run the c synthesis again uh, we can run through this uh, no i so someone's asking if the directives GUI is new in this version no it's it's been it's been in uh vitus hls and bravado hls for uh for a while actually now i really quite like it because it allows me to see the elements that, that, that the, the the elements that are in the design that I that I could work with, uh, and and things that, and the and the pragmas and the optimizations that I that I've applied, uh, and it allows you to do a little bit of thought and process and uh, and explore and exploring such things as you uh, as you go as you go through it. So I I quite I quite like that directive. Now now we've run this um, run this through here. We can see this time we get the standard. Uh, we get the same implementation results, the DSP, the, and such like. Uh, but if we scroll down, this time we find that we've got a an AXI an AXI interface. Uh, we've got a number of AXI registers in there. So we've got the control register, the interrupt enable registers, the the global interrupt enable register. Sorry, the interrupt enable register, the interrupt status register. And then the loop signal that I've asked it to, to, to put in there. We've still got the AP interface. Uh, and if there's a bit of funniness, that's just on my uh, an artifact on my screen, I think, from sharing the screen. It's not actually in the tool. Uh, we've still got the memory interface there. Now, 
Remember I said I wanted to talk to this using a microblaze or something like that, or maybe an Orca. If you want to go and take a look under your implementation, if you have the software, in, if you have um, if you have AXI interfaces and AXI slave AXI light interfaces, uh, when it does the synthesis, it will also create you the drivers uh, for that uh, for, to, to be used in your in your application. So, for example, now there's a C there's a C driver that's just been created to allow me to work with this IP block that we've created. Uh, so it gives us that nice that nice wrapping up of um, of functionality there, and we can do this, and we can change any we can change these interfaces to things that we that we want to as well, you know. So, for example, the A interface. Let's take a look. We can put it on the A interface, and it might be that actually we want to we want this to be in a it's in a memory, but it, it, it's in a VRAM. We might, we might want to put it in a master AXI or an AXI stream or something like that. And what's really nice about this is if you've got a block of code uh, that does the functionality you want, you can change how it interfaces with with, sev with, with several different devices quite quickly and uh, quite quickly and easily. Uh, so I, I, it gives you that maximum flexibility to port your IP uh, between 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 designs and between applications without having to kit, sit there and go, oh no, I wrote this with such and such an interface and now I've got to rewrite it with an AXI with an AXI interface. So that's gonna. So this is our second lab now. So it brings us to the end of taking a look at lab two, where what we've done in this one is we've worked out, you know, how to uh, control the interfaces that we might have using the using the directive view to 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 be able to say what we want to do in terms of AXI master AXI control interfaces. We've learned that it gives us the um, the software output it gives us the C code output, nice and easy for our, for our drivers if we want to work with uh, want to work with processors, and we can control and we can change we can change that even more. So if I'm just going to change this uh, this interface here, and I didn't put this in the um, didn't put this in the uh, in the actual hand, the, the notes, uh, but we'll just run this again and just see uh, how it. Um, how it runs through and how it handles it, and we should see it. We should see it changing at the uh, at the top level at the top level there. I'm doing. If you've got any questions, again, like I say, pop them in the uh, pop them in the chat window, and we will try and uh, answer uh, answer these as we uh, as we go through it. So this time now we've run through, and we can see we've got the same AXI control. We've got the same AXI control registers in there. I apologize, I don't know why my computer does that when, I, when it's scrolling down. Uh, AXIS stands for AXI stream. Yes, it does indeed. Sorry, I should have been clear. It stands for AXI stream. Uh, and we have now, you can see that we've got the AXI, the input now. It's not a memory interface, an AP memory interface now, but it's coming in as an AXI stream. And we can change that to, uh, we can change that to our heart's content. I quite, it's, it's so flexible and it's so flexible and powerful. You can see as we do this, uh, we can see as we do this, the utilization changes slightly as well because the 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 the, the RTL, the synthesis that's being created, is wrapping through uh, and showing uh, and using uh, and implementing new structures, new logical structures uh, to 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 do this. Um, yeah, so if you're not familiar with AXI protocol, yeah, it, it's the AXI4 uh, protocol communication that, that most Silex IP cores use, and we should be using when we develop our own IP to make it as portable and flexible as possible. Uh, AXI uh, streaming is the simple unidirectional uh, stream of that. Of course, there's the AXI memory map, uh, the full version, and we can implement that. So maybe we want, let's try this, maybe we want B. This is the world's most complicated, simple uh, simple logic block, uh, but we could put this on a interface here, and we could say we want that as a master AXI interface. I believe uh, might have to get the depth actually uh, for a simulation. Uh, we can save that, and then we can rerun synthesis. So somebody's asked a very interesting question about: Is it directly possible to write outputs directly to DRAM? Um, 
yes, uh, but how you're going to do it is you're not going to put like a DRAM control, you're not going to put a memory interface controller in your FPG in your FPGA. What you're going to do is you're going to use a function called uh, memcopy. Uh, and memcopy is going to memcopy is a really useful thing when it implements in uh, Vitus HLS. It's going to give you a DMA type structure uh, that you can connect as a as an AXI memory map bus, just as we've done. And that'll give you the AXI memory map port, and you can connect that then to your to your to your memory interface to your memory interface generator through your AXI network in there, and you can read and write that, and then that will pull in the data uh, as as you want it. Obviously, when you're working with DRAM, you want to pull in as big a chunk of data as, as possible to save time on that transition time going on and off, going on and off chip. Uh, so we can see in this instance now we've gone from a simple uh, a simple memory interface. Uh, we've got a master mem we've got a master AXI interface now. We've got a slave light interface uh, with the registers, and we've got the AXI stream register. So, just to show you just how flexible and powerful this uh, this tool is when it comes to when it comes to interfacing, because I think it's uh, really uh, really important. So I'm going to close that project, and then we're going to take a look at oh, close project. Uh, and then we're going to create another project. We're going to call this one Lab Three. Uh, very um, off the top of my head, it's a very original name, of course. We're going to go to the C drive again. I'm going to scroll through and find my HLS Live. We're going to select that there. Uh, so iteration initiation violations. We can we can we can have a chat about Al Alessandro. They they do. Uh, it is one of the things that becomes quite interesting when we do uh, uh, Vitus, H Vitus HLS type approaches. Uh, so someone was just asking about the tutorial direct to DRAM. Yes, there is. If you go to my blog, and uh, just in case you're not familiar with where my blog is, I will put it up here. Uh, but if you go to my um, if you go to my website. Uh, and go to my and go to the blog. I think it's on the blog archive. Actually, I I, I do think it's on the blog archives, not the not the actual blog. So I think it's on one of the Xilinx uh, blog archives. There's an example there of how to use memcopy uh, to, to to do exactly what I was just just talking about. So this time I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to add. Uh, we're not going to have any uh, any files neither. We're going to select a different. We're going to select my favourite board again, a fairly mid-range, uh, mid-range board. So as where, uh, so as we're nice and accessible to people that are that are following along. And this time we're going to do a little bit of signal processing. It's going to be the world's most simple uh, little bit of uh, little bit of signal processing. Um, so maybe 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 actually that's the thing. Maybe we'll do maybe we'll do a maybe we'll do a tutorial on maybe we'll do a tutorial on pedal limits. I'll throw a uh, throw a, throw a poll upon uh, throw a poll upon uh, on on that. Linux be of interest. Not, not not that you can tell. I'm an engineer, and I've just found this um, found this poll. Um, um, Whole option and it interests me. Um, uh, so we can take a look at that. So yeah, so we've got this project. What we're going to do now is we're going to do some simple HL. We're going to do some sig simple uh, simple processing. Uh, we're going to create a project under Lab Three. I'm going to call it Lab Three uh, It's going to create me a file from the files on my download. I'm going to copy in the data. If you want to, you can add this in. It's just, I think it's easier to teach you all how to create these things uh, from beginning lab 3.h. And in lab 3.h, I can do this. And then we're going to create a test bench of our feet. We use the test bench in this one, lab 3 dot cd. But oh, yes, we do. But to be fair, we've given you the test bench as well. 
Um, and you've noticed, you'll notice if you downloaded this, you'll notice there's another file um, in there as, as well that we're, that we're going to use called input.dat. Uh, and the input.dat, it's just a simple data file. It's just got a list of uh, list of numbers uh, stored, stored in it. Uh, that actually, Nima, your question there uh, might actually be more interesting for a uh, might actually be interesting for a blog or a um, or a project on a project on Hackster, perhaps something like uh, something like that. So, so we'll get that. So we've got a simple, now what we've got is we've got a simple, uh, a simple feature here, a simple function here. We're just going to do a really simple, uh, simple filter. It's just a box filter. It's just going to do a roll in, a roll in average. We're just going to be taking 16 samples. We're going to, we're going to accumulate these and we're going to create an output and we're going to, we're going to pop that out. Now, obviously when we're working with any mathematics, you know, we might need to think about the results and the output types that we're working in and, and the growth of them and whether the number can be represented. And again, notice I'm still using int 16s, the standard sort of uh, standard sort of numbers. Uh, I'm not using unsigned, obviously I'm using, uh, using signed numbers. Uh, but I've defined two types, input and output type. And this, this gives me the flexibility to begin to change things as I want to, um, as I want to change things as we're working. Uh, as we're working through them. Say I decided that I don't want to use int 16s anymore, I want to use a different type. Uh, then I've already written my code such that it just changes my input or my um, or my output, um, my output code. So we have this simple simple file here, simple accumulator, simple accumulator here. We have the test bench. Now, what the test bench is going to do this time is because sometimes we want to read and write in from files. Um, and so we're going to be able to read and write. We're going to read and write in from a file here. Now, one of the really exciting things about Vitus HLS is we can use a lot of things in that C test bench. So if we want to do some image processing and want to pull in things from, say, OpenCV or whatever like that, we can, we can, we can do that in the, uh, in the, in the file. It's in the, we can do that in the C test bench itself and then stream that data through our IP core, let the IP core do its processing and then stream it all back out. And we can see that we can catch that image and save that image as a bitmap or a JPEG and, and see what we want to see or want to do with it. And if you want to see that and how to do that, there are some examples. I didn't include it in this class because it's it's a little long winded, uh, but there are some examples on that you can find via my via my blog channel as to as to how uh, how to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to load it. We're going to add this. We're going to add a test bench file, uh, and we're going to find my um, we're going to find my download. We're going to find my file. So I've stored it under Git. Uh, it's under Vitus Hero Lab Three and Output. So now, if I look under my files here, I should see I've got some uh, I've got a input dot that. And a um, and the and the and the test bench, which should give me everything we need to do uh, to begin to go through uh, running it. So let's let's try that. Let's just check sure that I've got everything right and it's all going to work. Uh, let's just run the C simulation just to prove that. I'm not going to launch the debugger this time. I'm just going to run it through and hopefully it will find everything. Go back to the console. There we go, and it comes up, gives us a result of two thousand two hundred and thirty-three, which happens to be uh, the magic number that we're that we're looking for. So that just proves that our algorithm is running uh, is running as we as we want it to do. All we're going to do is we're going to come into the project settings here, uh, and we're going to select because we're going to select our top level, and we're going to call this uh, sensor filter this time. And then we are going to run the C synthesis. Is there any questions while that C synthesis is is running? Please throw it in there, and I will uh, I will answer them. Uh, that's good. 
seems quite a lot of people are interested in a pedal Linux uh, pedal Linux session, uh, which could be could be quite exciting. Uh, as we run this through, what we'll what we'll see now when our synthesis results come out, we'll see that our uh, our filter is uh, capable of it has a latency of 20 cycles, so it takes 20 clock cycles to run through, uh, and it has an interval of 21, so it'll be 21 clock cycles. We can start our filter. We can start our filter again. Uh, we've used 32 flip flops and 184 lookup tables uh, in doing that. Uh, so let's take a look at the um, let's take a look now at it and how it all works. So we'll take a look at the function call graph uh, from Synthesis, uh, and we can see if you've never seen this one before, we can see where we can see the function call, and this is slightly more useful when we've got lot when we when we've got different functions that are called on each other. But we can see each one. We can see the initiation interval here. Uh, of 21 for the for the for the top one, we can see the latency. Uh, we can see anything, any accesses there that that come in. Um, that come in. Ah, that's a good point. We're going to come to that in a minute as to why we've named the loop. Uh, we we can uh, we can run through here and we can see any latencies and impacts from VRAM, UltraRAM, DSPs, uh, and we can see that as we go through the pipeline accumulate the pipeline accumulator. Um, and the and the accumulated loop here that we've, we've called the queue. So you can do some interesting things with this if you want to. You can see the you can see it by you can sit, take a look at it by uh, by the heat map, by initiation interval, by latency, uh, by BRAM or, or by BRAM or URAM. Uh, and it, it's quite an interesting. And we'll take a look at this more when we take a look at the final at the final lab as well. Uh, with the lab, we'll, 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 we'll see that. Uh, so we'll close that for the time being. Uh, and the reason why we've named this, so we can actually we can actually take a look at our schedule viewer as well, uh, and we can see in the schedule viewer, we can see basically the the, the, the time that it takes uh, as we go through uh, the accumulated. The accumulated loop because it takes more than one. It takes more than one clock cycle, and we're going through it uh, a number, a number of a number of times. So, if you want to address this, let's say we want to try and uh, reduce this and make this quite a low-level element. And the reason why I've named this for loop is because we want to apply elements to this. We want to apply elements to this. Uh, and that's what we're about to touch on, Andre, is about to touch on unrolling loops uh, and running them in parallel. And because I've named it here, it makes it makes it more, it makes it visible in, well, it's always visible in the directives window. Uh, but because I've named it here, you, you see a nice name here in the directives window for it. And it means that I can, that we can apply a directive to it. If we don't have it named here, then we can still apply directive to it, but it will apply its own. Name. It will name the for loop on its own, which will not be as readable and as, main, and as maintainable. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at this. We're going to say, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to unroll this loop. So I want to actually make make this entire loop implemented uh, in in parallel, as opposed to being as opposed to running through sequentially uh, or being pipelined. It's only a fairly small out fairly small algorithm. I want to uh, want to unroll it. Now, whenever we do optimizations like this, we're always going for the trade-off between parallel between uh, between pat between perform between performance and throughput, uh, and uh, a between between performance and utilization of the device. So we have to be careful. It's that it's that trade-off. So we're going to click OK here on unroll. Uh, we're going to click on input uh, because it's a it, it's potentially a, a block ramp. Uh, so we will tell that to partition the we will tell that to partition the array uh, as well. Uh, and then we're going to save that. Better save that. Uh, and then we'll rerun that again.
take a few seconds to, to run through. So yeah, Andre, it will build whatever's necessary that we if we've put it put it in there. So what we'll see this time is our latency is one clock cycle. Excellent. So every other clock cycle, every clock cycle, we can uh, begin to put we can begin to get data out of it. We can we can pack we can push this through. Uh, our utilization's gone up, but it's a fairly small function, so I can uh, I'm happy I'm happy ish with that. Uh, and we can see how we can do that and change uh, and change the elements quite easily there. And we can do this combined as well with the interfacing elements as well. There's nothing to stop us in here using the directives, you know, changing these inputs and outputs as well to have different types of interface standards uh, that we uh, that we want. But that gives us a nice feature to get the to do to do that optimization and, and performance. And if we take a look again at the schedule viewer. Uh, we can see that we that, that everything is really running in uh, truly in truly in parallel. So we've done our trade-off of performance uh, for uh, uh, we, we, <laughs> that's interesting, Alessandra. Uh, we, we've done a little. We've done a trade-off of uh, performance for uh, performance for uh, requirements. It actually might depend upon what board you've targeted it into and the clock speed that you've defined as well that will that will drive that. So these optimizations, you know, there's a there's a huge range of optimizations that we could do. We might not we might not want to do a unroll, uh, but we might want to do perhaps a pipelining and tell it that we want a initiation interval of one uh, and we'll run we will run that through. I think by default it's decide, it's tr it tries to pipeline anyway uh, in Vitus HLS, but we, we will see what the we see what the difference is, uh, and then we will move on. Well, that's done it. So this is really sort of the summary of Lab Three. Is just showing you how to introduce, how to nicely introduce um, these optimizations. That trade-off between performance and utilization, and how we again how we go and adding those those pragmas. So, and, and how we can visualize what's going on in the system with the uh, with the shed with the schedule viewer. So to make sure that I can stick to about the time that we that we've got for today, I'm going to close this. I'm going to close this project. I'm going to create the, the fourth project. We call this one Lab Four. We're going to save this on my C drive again under HLS Live. It's going to be next, next, next. We're going to target the trusty SD701. And then we're going to create the simple, we're going to use the files that are provided within the, uh, within the lab, within the lab for element to do this. So what we're going to, what we're going to do here is we're going to create a new source file under lab4. We're going to call it lab4.cpp. We're going to add in the code. And this time we're going to create a, uh, a PID. Actually, it's not a PID. It's just a PI, uh, as most of these things turn out to be in reality. Uh, we're going to create a lab4.h. Ah, we're going to create a test bench because we should always do test. We should always have test benches for everything that we uh, that we do, whether it be HLS or whether it be uh, RTL or or Verilog, RTL, VHDL or Verilog, even. So we have this. We have a we have a application. Now let's take a look at this quickly. Uh, what we see is that we have a um, we have a simple uh, PID. Uh, in this PID, we get past a set point. That's the point that we want to drive towards. We've got the KI, the K, the KP, the KI, the KD constants that get put in there. We get past the sample. We've got the sampling period, and then we've got a limit for the power maximum power that can be that can be output. 
Now, actually, we've got all these running in this instance. They're all they're all mapped to have a AXI interface, and that's just because the application that I bought it from had a AXI interface in there. And then we're running the standard sort of normal uh, PID equation. Actually, when we did the analysis on this, the PI was fine. It didn't need to. We didn't need to include the the, the, the derivative element of it. Uh, so that's not included in the calculation. And all we do is, if the output is above the, the certain uh, the certain power max, then we limit to the limit to the power limit to the maximum power. Otherwise, uh, we go around and we we allow that output if it's below the maximum if it's below the maximum power. We have a test bench here. Our test bench is going to load in all these lovely samples. It's got some sample values here. So this is a real world application. Actually, it's going to be. Uh, this PI is going to be flying on a satellite in the not too distant future, and these are real world samples uh, from from the control loop system. We've got the KP, the K. They've got KP, the KI coefficients in uh, watts per Kelvin and watts per Kelvin per second. And then we have the obviously we have the outputs here with the uh, with the calling the PID algorithm and just running it through and each one of these samples. We're trying to get to a set point of minus 80, um, 80 by the way. So uh, we're actually heating up to get to, my, we're actually heating up to get to minus 80, um, which, is, which is quite cool. Uh, and we've got this, so this is run through. Now, when you initially do this, you might want to do it within a floating point, using the floating point number system. So as I said in the previous lab, what we've done is we've defined a, type definition and I've called them data type, long data type and long, long data type. Very imaginative name in here. Um, and initially we've said that they're going to be used for the um, for the floating point. So we can use a floating point approach here and this will run through uh, and we'll use a floating point implementation within our uh, within our within our solution. So if we run this through, and we run through the synthesis, so let's run run the synthesis. Oh, forgot to set that top level again. Oh, now it's thinking. So we set the top level. Uh, we can run the synthesis. And we can run through. And this, what's really nice about this is that Vivado HLS, you know, it will synthesize those floating point numbers and put them into our in, put them into our design. But obviously, if we put them into our design, it's not going to give us the best implementation uh, that we that we might achieve and that we that we might want, because it's going to come with a large footprint so in this instance we can see a large footprint 1242 flip-flops 1300 lookup tables eight dsps it's got a interval of 26 clock cycles and it's got and it's got a latency of 25 clock cycles and that's when we're using the um the floating point conversion and what's more interesting as well is we have to put these numbers in here so the kp the ki the kd we have to put these in here. We have to write these in as floating point numbers and floating point elements as well when we when we do that and, and pass them in in the correct format to work with the with the number system that we that we've defined. Now, if we're using the C the C plus plus version, which is why these files are called CPP, uh, we can we can use uh, we can use what are called the AP fixed type, which is an arbitrary precision uh, fixed type. And what that does is that tells us the the overall the overall size of the number. So if we take a look here, we can see that we've got the uh, the width of it, the integer the integer the integer bit of it, and then any additional elements here, such as the the rounding and the overflow the overflow uh, the overflow mode. So we've we've got this now. What we have to remember is the rules of fixed point mathematics. Now, the tool takes care of this automatically for us but we have to make sure that decimal points are aligned and yada 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 now the tool takes care of all that of all that for us what it doesn't take care of is making sure that the result is correctly sized to store the 
to store the data in. So if we multiply two, just a quick recap on fixed point number system, if we recap, two, if we multiply two 16 bit numbers together, we get a 32 bit result. In a floating point, it, it stores in the same floating point. In a fixed point, it, it, the fixed point it fixes it goes into has to be 32 bits. And as we go through our algorithm, our algorithm will grow as we as we do this, hence the slightly different data types that we've got in here. So we've got the initial data type that gets put in, which is a eight, which is a 16 bit arbitrary precision with eight integer and eight fractional bits. We've then got a that we've then got a, the result from that that gets stored in a 32 bit element. And then the final result, which gets stored in a 48 in a 48 bit element. So as we go through this maps, we, while we don't have to worry about the the rules of you know the alignment rules and such like because Vitus HLS takes care of that. We do have to make sure that we can store the results correctly and the numbers uh, and, and the vectors uh, correctly. So we can change this if we want. We can we can change this within the definition type here. We can save this again uh, and we can rerun our synthesis. I remember last time we had an iteration of 26 clock cycles to run around and do an initiation and over a thousand flip-flops and a thousand and a thousand looks to implement a relatively simple, uh, a relatively simple uh, PI, PID, alg PID algorithm. Uh, and this is obviously without any optimization, without any performance, without any performance on it. So it's really key to use these libraries when we to use these tools when we come to it. Because what we find is that we get a much better implementation uh, using fixed point, arbitrary precision fixed point, than we do if we use the floating point. So we get in this instance, we get a six cycle, we get a six cycle latency and a, a seven cycle interval. And remember, we've not optimized this as we learned in the previous lab, so we could take a look at doing some optimization in there. Uh, and we also get the get a much reduced DSP count, flip flop count, and uh, logic count. So we've we've more than halved the resources. There would be before it was it was eight DSP, twelve hundred and forty two flip flops, and thirteen hundred and nine lookup tables. And now we're down to a relatively low number there uh, for the uh, well, relatively low number, much less than half, just by using that arbitrary position. So. Again, it gives us the bet, it gives us that nice flexibility, that nice optimization that we can do uh, within our designs. Uh, so someone who's just asking a question, is using AP thoughts on ports really feasible, re really reasonable? And it is, yeah, use, using AP data types is much better than using the floating point, than using the floating point data types in your real world system. Uh, you might want to initially create the system like I've done, where we had a where you have the option to change between floating point and fixed point implementations. And for that initial floating point one, you just use you use floating points to crack your algorithm, get your get your algorithm correct. Once you've done this, then you can pull in the AP, you can pull in the AP fixed and um, and run with it. Converting between the AP, converting between them is relatively simple. Um, you can, there are some function calls, some library calls that you can use. A lot of it is uh, relatively uh, automatic as uh, as well, so it helps you. So the tool helps you quite significantly uh, in that area, in that area to, to to do that. So it gives you a big difference uh, between user. Just going back to wrap up really on lab four before we take a look at the final lab. This gives us a big difference really to run through and see the to see the data that we've got uh, and see the implementation that we've got when we're doing uh, when we're doing it with this uh, with this with this solution, and it's a big. I think it's an important element uh, element to do. And I think to be fair, let's just run the let's just run the C simulation here uh, for you. And this is currently running on. Um, it's currently running on the fixed point implementation, so the AP fix. So we'll quickly just run. Uh, we'll quickly just run that. Uh, I'm going to go to this one here, Xilinx. So you can see here on our 
uh, as our elements being run through uh, on our uh, on our design. Uh, you can see the output that's come out of the results. And you can see initially we've clipped the power to 40 um, because that's the PID was demanding higher power and our system clips it limits it at that, at that limit. You'll see then that it's run through and you'll see then that it's applied a higher power and it's begun to converge as we've fed the data into it. And we've then manipulated the data a bit to send it into and out of and out of sort of convergence as the temperatures fluctuated a little bit. But these results are the right sort of driving uh, driving element for it. And you can see that conversion, I didn't really call any particular conversion functions. I just did it in my um, I just did it in the in the test bench level uh, in the test bench level here, so it makes it nice and simple and easy um, easy to do. Or I'd like to think so anyway. So right, for the final project, what we're going to do is we're going to close the project for Vitus HLS, and then we're going to go across and take a look here at the uh, the Vitus Light the Vitus Library. Uh, and you'll notice that the Vitus library is quite quite comprehensive. We've got BLAST, Codec, Data Analytics, Data Compression, DSP, Vision, Utilities, quite a whole range of uh, of libraries there. And you'll see that all tagged on slightly different slightly different versions as as well uh, that are that are available. Let's just tag that 2021.2 release that we're that we're working with to make sure that we've got the right uh, the right version there. And we can see that we've got it all. We've, we can see that we've got the, the blast, the data analytics, the, the genomics, and, and everything that's uh, that's possibly that's possibly needed there. What we're going to do is we're going to get this code uh, and we're going to download it. So you can either download it via the via as a zip or via a GitHub uh, via a Git client. Uh, once you've done this, and I'm hoping that uh, mine's still downloaded and I've not optimized it away when I've been clearing out my uh, my Git repository. Once you've done this, you will see a structure such as this within your uh, within your uh, either zip file or your cloned your cloned Git re Git repository. Uh, and if you take an explore around these, what you'll see is there are a number of levels. So there's level one, level two. Uh, level one is sort of bravado IP block type stuff. Level two is more integrated examples that would come with. Uh, the full the full Vitus Vitus flow, and in some instances you can see I think the Vision one there is a level there is a level three as well. But there's also test bench examples and everything that we uh, that we need need in there. So now we have this, we're going to come back into Vivado HLS. We're going to create our final project, and we're going to call it Lab Five. And in Lab 5, we're going to store it on my C drive again under HLS Live. And select that. We're going to click Next. Uh, oh, I'm going to click Next actually on this one. Yep, we are. We're going to create our project again, empty. We're going to target, I'm going to target the Spartan board again because why change the habit of a webinar? Uh, so we're going to target that. Uh, we're going to target that Spartan board. Gonna take a few minutes to uh, to create, and then what we're going to do is we're going to pull in these examples from one of these example projects from the Vitus library, and we're going to we're going to build it. So we're going to go to source. We're going to go to add sources this time, as opposed to creating sources, and then we're going to go to our Git Git repo. Um, and the Git repo, I, the one I'm going to install, is under the Vitus libraries. We're going to go under the uh, the DSP element. We're going to create a DSP element. We're going to take a look under the level one library, and then we're going to take a look under examples, and then we're going to take a look at the one D fixed impulse. Uh, and under the source there, we will see uh, three files, uh, and we're going to copy these in the data path, the top module, and the um, and the uh, the top module header file. So you can click open on that, and then we'll see we've got these uh, we've got these files added into our uh, our tool. 
Next, we'll go to our test bench. Uh, we will add a new test bench file, and we will, it remembers where we were. We'll just add in that main.cpp. Um, and if we want to take a look, you take a look at this module.cpp, you can see it's calling some functions that are defined uh, within the within the head within the header file. So these are very optimized, um, very optimized uh, libraries and implement and implementation there to get us to get us going. We're going to go to our project settings. We're going to select the synthesis. We're going to browse, and this is about to get. Once we've got that, we're going to find and we're going to put that select the top module. It's thinking. Uh, so we're going to go with FFT top. Uh, we're going to click on OK. Once we've got that, we need to put in uh, we need to put in some flags, uh, some compil some compiler flags. Uh, so hopefully these are uh, going to work because they're a little bit they're a little bit uh, a little bit complicated. So let's go to the and I'm going to copy and paste these ones in. Uh, so I hope they actually. Um, they actually do work. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the. Um, we need to tell the tool, uh, essentially for the DSP element, we need to tell the we need to tell the tool where the where the where this path where these paths are. Uh, so we're going to do this. We're going to set the uh, we're going to set the C flags for, for these modules. Um, we're going to edit the C flags and we're going to put in this long uh, long path. Uh, and we'll do this for. I hope we'll put the C simulation ones in, just in the interest of uh, just in the interest of time, because I've got a feeling. Oop, got a feeling this might. I think I've got a space on there. Oh, no. So we're going to set these. Uh, we're going to set these flags um, in there that hopefully will will pack. And now this assumes that my my pack is on is on my is on my path so you might have to make some little edits to yours uh, if we click again i'm just going to double check that they all they all stayed and they didn't why didn't those flags stay i had this before so what i'm going to do just to make sure this works is i'm going to close this project and i'm going to open the demo the demo project that I did to test it, just to make sure that we uh, get the best get the best out of it. So in this one, I've got the flag. We've got the flags all set properly uh, for it, and I'm just going to synthesize it again. Again, going into the the, the, the Spartan, uh, and it'll take this one. Will take a few. Uh, this one. Will take a few few seconds, few minutes uh, to 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 run to run through. So if you've got any questions, now is a good time to uh, start about thinking them and dropping them into the uh, in into the chat, uh, and we'll we'll I'll try and I will try and answer them to the best of my ability. If not, I'll take a quick break because I appear to have been talking for nearly uh, for nearly two hours. It's amazing how. Uh, Amazing how time flies when you when we when we do these webinars. I was uh, a little a little concerned we'd get through it quickly, but uh, but we seem to be doing really uh, really quite well on it. So as this is running through, you can see it's making some optimizations and such like as it's going through and giving out some information as to what's going on. Yes, the, uh, so I might have to get back to you on how to do that with the HLS template uh, on the uh, just on the AXI screen. But you can certainly control. Uh, the AXI side signals and sideband signals that are that are added as as part of it, uh, and I'm just trying to think if one of my blogs actually sh actually shows it. Uh, so if you can drop me an email, I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you how to uh, I'll t I'll t I'll take I'll take a look and I'll point you in the right direction as to as to how how that's possible or not.
oh, see, this is the more complicated, the, obviously, the more complicated the module, the more the, the longer it takes to just sort of run through uh, and get up and running. So the the flags are essentially yeah the flags are essentially telling it where to find the uh, where to find the libraries and, and the the, inc the inclusion paths for the for the libraries. Uh, you can run this through. Um, uh, we can we can run we can you can run this through from a command line and the project will automatically create it all for you. I just thought it was a little bit more exciting uh, to see it actually created and run through. Uh, built yeah, it, it is going to be available as a, as a replay. You should just be able to go, I think, pretty much once I click the end event button, uh, it becomes uh, it becomes available for for live for live replay. So you can go and uh, you can go and replay and watch it. And if it's not, uh, I I told it to record anyway. So if it's not, I'll throw it up on my YouTube channel. Uh, and put a link out to it from the uh, from the blog. Um, so the volatile keywords is an interesting element because it tells it not to not to you know not to touch that data, uh, and you also need the volatile to get some to do some state to do some stable. You're right to do some uh, AP valid outputs. So I actually have a blog written on the use of the uh, the volatile keyword uh, in in Bravado HLS and Vitus HLS, uh, which I which I published a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it might be my website was li linked up the channel, so it might be worthwhile taking a look at that and seeing what you can uh, what you can do. Uh, okay, so somebody was just saying how it, the IP handles complex input and outputs and data which and again that's down to you. You define that when you're working with it. If you're if you're working with a, you know, and a, 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 just like you're doing your BHDL and your Verilog, if you're working with a AP a, 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 a UINT 16, then it's going to be 16 bits. If you're working with an AP32 or an AP72 or something like that, an arbitrary precision bit, that's going to define that arbitrary uh, precision element. So once we've got this in, we can see this running through, and we can take a look again now at the uh, at the function call graph, and we can see this time we've got uh, it's a little bit more it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, we can explore the data flow viewer, which is something that we've not seen, which we've seen for the first time. So as you can see how the data flow flows through with the four with the four ports and the four output ports, and how it flows through the system. So again more visualization to help you do that and help you understand it. We also get in this instance, we also get, because we're going for a relatively slow device, all FPGA devices these days are quite quick, but it, compared to the other, what's available, it's a relatively slow device. Uh, we end up with a, uh, we get a timing, we get a timing violation. Uh, so if we want to investigate this, so, so this is a, this is not a, a, a loop initiation interval. This is the design thinks it's not going to be able to achieve the implementation of the re required clock frequency that we've asked it to do when we when coupled with the uh, the clock uncertainty. So we can take a look here and we can ask it to go into uh, one of the into many of the reasons uh, that we have the uh, that we have the timing that we have the, where the timing violation is. Uh, and we can take a look here and we can ask it, for example, to go to the timing violation and it will go to the timing violation in the schedule viewer such that we can see that in the in the schedule viewer and, and try to understand it. We can change a timing vi violation here, the focus, the focus element here. And if we want to as well, because obviously at the end of the day, we need to understand, we need to take a little bit of a look at the code to work out if there's any optimizations we can do. We want to really narrow in on where on where that is. So we can run this and we can ask it to go to the source line and you'll see that it opens on the uh, on the source line. And this really brings us pretty much to the to the end of our two hour whistle stop tour of sort of a hands on lab in uh, in Vitus HLS. 
In this final one, we've learned sort of, you know, how to do the, how to access the Vitus libraries that are available, you know, how to include level one libraries within Vitus HLS and how to, and how to build that. We've taken a little bit of a look at the function calls and the data flow graphs and how to identify timing violations uh, and how to find that source code such that we can do it. So on our journey today, we've gone from real sort of the very beginning of this, how do we create a project and, and do a simple hello world to how do we, once we've created that project, how do we control the interfacing on that project? Once we've got that project and we understand the interfacing, how do we control the optimizations on that project? Then it's how can we optimize our implementation using the correct form of mathematics as well, you know, the arbitrary precision mathematics. And then once we've got that, it's well, we don't, we're engineers, we should be reusing wherever possible. We shouldn't be going from scratch and writing everything from scratch. So it's how can we leverage those Xilinx libraries, those Vitus libraries that are available to us to help us uh, accelerate our designs and save us having to write everything from, uh, from scratch. So there has been a nice linear flow, linear progression, I hope you agree, as to work through how to how to get this uh, how to get this going uh, and work and working. Uh, one other thing that I've not shown you actually, and we've got a couple of minutes left. And to be fair, a little while ago, I didn't think we I, I thought we'd be uh, we'd be in a little bit of a rush. Uh, but one thing we can do at the end of this, obviously, is we want to export this and use this in Vivado in this instance is what our, is what our application is. So we want to come over here and we want to go to the export RTL option. And you can see here, this will give us the opportunity to export the RTL. So we can say how we want to export it. Do we want to export it as a zip? Are we going to be using it with system generator? In this case, instance, we'll just use it as a zip. We can define the output location that we want to store this, that we want to store this in. We can put the vendor name in, so I can put in ADIUVO. We could put in the library, for example, what's this? So this is DSP FFT HLS, for example. Uh, we could put in the version, it's 1.0. We can put a description in it. We can put a display name in it. So DSP FFT ADIVO. Um, and we can export this then to our, uh, to our design. So let me click on OK so we can export that. It might be actually that this doesn't export because I've just remembered there is a tiny little uh, bug in Vitus HLS and I patched it in all of the other versions. Uh, but then I installed this version. And I can't remember if I applied the patch or uh, if I applied the patch or not. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't uh, I didn't apply the patch uh, in this into this version of uh, Vitus HLS. Uh, Vitus HLS, but there's a simple two-second patch that will uh, that will get around this. It came in at the beginning of the year. I only installed this version uh, a couple of weeks ago for the uh, for the tool. So with that, that really pretty much wraps us up and brings us to the end. If anybody's got any questions, I would love to try uh, any questions that we've not done. I would love to try and answer. If anybody's got any suggestions about what they'd like to see next as an as a next uh as a next as a next workshop uh then then please pop it in the uh, pop it in the chat as well maybe a cnn example so i think i think it would be interesting to do a Vitus AI. Uh, maybe it would be interesting to do a Vitus AI flow. Obviously, that would be uh, that would be using the Vitus AI, not the uh, not the Vitus HLS implementation of a uh, of a of a CNN. So, like I said, if there's any questions, just pop them in there, and we'll try and answer. Oh, I'll just let me check the questions. Actually, see if anybody actually put anything in there that we've not answered. Um, so, somebody was asking about um, how do you make the decision between doing RTL or BHDL or HLS solutions, um, and. A lot of this comes from experience, as you know, what's going to go well in Vitus HLS and what's going to be better in better in RT in better in RTL. 
I must admit, these days, I try to do as much in and productivity, obviously, is key when you run a small business. Uh, so we try to, uh, we try to use uh, as much HLS as possible to make us as productive as possible. Uh, so nine times out of 10, we will start out using a HLS approach and only if we get real complicated, real barriers, real issues, uh, do we begin to think about moving across and implementing a RT, an RTL or an, an RTL approach. Um, yes, it will do the clock domain crossing if you have the if you have the uh, the the clock in it. But I think, uh, but it, but I don't think you do that. In you only have a single clock still uh, in this. So the AXI clock. To make the AXI slave clock will still be at the same frequency that the AXI core clock is run, is is running at, um, and the AXI and any clock domain crossing you want to do will be implemented in the smart interconnect or the AXI interconnect that you use to connect the uh, to connect the modules together. Okay. Any more questions? If you think of them after you've if you think of them after you've attended this session, then you've all got my email address. You should already be able to download uh, download that that download that GitHub. Uh, I'll put you my uh, I'll put you my email my website in there again, which has got all my contacts in it. And we also I will also put in the um, I didn't do it in that one, did I? Uh, I will also put in my, I'm just looking for my for my repo now. Uh, where's it gone? Uh, for my GitHub repo where you can find uh, where you can find all the links to everything again. So with that, I will thank you all for your attendance and questions and uh, and I hope you've been I hope it's been enjoyable uh, and I hope you've learned something and I hope you've realized, you know, I hope you've learned that um, that getting started with uh, Vitus HLS is 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 quite easy and, and quite nice to do, and it's a good a good thing to start going with. Okay, thank you very much.